in the last three verses of this section when Jesus is on trial and we've said again and again this trial is a sham the only reason that it's happening is because the high priest wants Jesus dead and he needs a council conviction so that the people who love Jesus won't complain. In verse 61, the trial climaxes when the high priest asks the most important question that anybody could ever ask. Who is Jesus? And last week we saw Jesus' response. He quotes four Old Testament passages and each one of them identifies him as God. He comes back with four answers and all of them say he's God. I wonder how do you respond to that? How do you deal with Jesus saying that as he claims to be the one who's responsible for making you and, and all that you are and have? As he claims to be the one to whom you owe every breath and heartbeat what's your response when I was growing up you would you would never see a statue of Buddha apart from in the movies maybe and and yet in the last 30 years they they've infiltrated and infested so many homes people have them in their living rooms and bedrooms and bathrooms there's nothing offensive about Buddha he says that there are many roads to heaven that everybody is right in their own way and in that sense Buddha really neatly dovetails with postmodernism which says everybody is right we recently visited a doctor in Invercargill who's a Hindu and on his desk next to his computer um, he's got a little figurine of Vishnu and then hanging up on his cork board is a crucifix that one of his Catholic patients had dropped once and he saw that as a sign from God to keep it and add Jesus into his little um, pantheon of, of gods and there's no discord in his thinking there it doesn't have a problem with that Vishnu and Jesus can share his office because in his mind Jesus is one of many gods that he can worship now that is not who Jesus says Jesus is the real Jesus has never been widely popular because he's not neat and he's not willing to share a desk with false gods he makes exclusive claims and people don't want that Jesus he says he's right and so everyone else is wrong now we ask the question is that really true can't Jesus fit in with other gods can't he be one of many and I just want to you know there's a number of art arguments that we could bring to that I just want to give you two things to provoke thought here one is just the nature of God doesn't allow for that the Old Testament only knows one God uh, and, and he is the one and only God and so Deuteronomy 6 4 here O Israel the Lord your God the Lord is one uh, and then in the book of Isaiah so clearly before me no God was formed Yahweh speaking here and after me there will not be one and so the only God the Old Testament knows is one God and that's who Jesus is claiming to be as he quotes the Old Testament he's not making a claim hey I'm a God I'm that God I'm Yahweh the one the only the ancient of days and then secondly think about the attributes of God I'm saying that God's character doesn't allow for multiple gods see if he's omnipotent meaning all powerful well then if there's another omnipotent God you've got a, a problem because suddenly there's something that omnipotence can't overpower and so neither of them are, are actually omnipotent you with me I'm making sense see logically it kind of falls apart the only way you can have one God is if there is one God who's all powerful all places all love you add another it breaks you add many it crumbles you think of Mormons they believe that they can become gods Joseph Smith famously said as God is man can become there are 16 million members of the Mormon church today 16 million gods as God in his omnipotence and his all-knowingness it just doesn't work totally illogical so Jesus you understand here this is why I'm stressing this he's not making some empty claim to be God like nor is he saying I'm one of many 
options. He gives you a choice like a light switch, which very conveniently just now was illustrated for us. That wasn't set up. It's either on or it's off, but it can't be both and it can't be neither. And so Jesus makes us choose. Are we for him or against him? There's no fence for us to straddle. Do we agree that he is God and show our agreement by worshipping him with our whole lives? Or do we call him a liar and show our disagreement by doing anything else? Some people would say that Jesus never claimed to be God. Jehovah's Witnesses turn a, a blind eye to the, the, the passages that Jesus is quoting in his response here and say that Jesus is just claiming to be a man. And you'll hear this a lot. You know, I said last week that this is perhaps the most popular position that we'll encounter. Jesus is a man, a good man, who his delusional disciples made into a God. How do we respond to that? And if we're looking at this text, how do we respond to the Jehovah's Witness who says, well, look, verse 62, I am and you will see the Son of Man. Jesus is only claiming to be a man. If somebody says that to you, you ask this simple question. If Jesus claimed to be a man, why did they react the way they did? Not just three things. First of all, he's accused. Verse 63, the high priest tore his garment and said, what further witnesses do you need? You have heard his blasphemy. Now, if Tim came up to me and said, I'm a man, I might be a little bit concerned, but I wouldn't rip my shirt off in a rage. If Sarah came up to me and said, I'm a man, that might be a different story. Verse 63 and 64, the high priest who knows God's law inside out, he has no doubt Jesus is not claiming to be a man because he accuses him of blasphemy. That's taking God's glory or running God's reputation through the mud. And so Caiaphas is saying here that Jesus of Nazareth, claiming to be God, the idea of God being reduced and confined to a carpenter from Galilee, it's too humiliating to imagine what you're saying is an offense worthy of death. Secondly, notice he's condemned. Verse 64. You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. So Caiaphas puts this to the vote. And, and one after another, from the oldest to the youngest, the wisest to the most foolish, every member of this council says he's worthy of death. And my old pastor preached on this text. He said the word death 71 times. One for each of the councillors, trying to get the congregation to appreciate something of what it would have felt like for the Lord Jesus. As he stood there and watched every one of these wise men of Israel look him in the eye and say, Death. 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 If Jesus had claimed to be a man, would he have been so condemned? Thirdly, he was abused. The Jesus of modern imagination who isn't God but a, a moral teacher who never said such narrow-minded things as I am the way, the truth, and the life. He who has seen me has seen the Father. That Jesus, he warmly received everywhere. The Jesus who doesn't make the exclusive claims. The Jesus that the world around us invents. That Jesus, he can cuddle up to the most cautious skeptic. But the real Jesus, the one who walked our planet and said these words. Even respectable, hospitable, religious people wanted nothing to do with him. Look at verse 65. Some began to spit on him, to cover his face and strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. I think we're meant to get the impression, the way that that verse is written, that at the end the guards receive him with blows. But before that, it's even the counselors who are spitting, striking, calling him to prophesy. And, and so you see, this isn't just a trial. There's no sense in which there's kind of the, the moral high ground of, of law being offered out of justice, being meted out against Jesus. This is direct aggression against him. And why? Because he claimed to be a man? No. You think soldiers would 
spit on someone or beat them for claiming humanity? No. But this man claimed to be God. And more than that, he claimed to be their God. He claimed to be the one who has ultimate power. And these squaddies who know all about power are going to show him what real strength looks like the only way they know power. And so they'll humiliate him and punch him and ask him to say through a blindfold, who is it that hit you? They say, come on, you're meant to be God. And a boot goes into his stomach. And they say, tell us, all-knowing one, omniscient God, who gave you this? And a fist lands on his temple and knocks him down. There can be no doubt from a text like this. Jesus claimed to be God. Let's develop it. I want to say, if he was lying, he deserved everything that he got. 2005, a man named Robert Hendy Frigo was arrested. Uh, for 10 years, he conned a, a great number of people out of huge sums of money by convincing them that he was an MI5 secret agent operating around London. He was engaged to six women at the same time. He would take their money and tell them he was off on a secret mission while he was on holiday in Brazil. He made slaves out of his victims, is what the police said, by having them run errands for him and telling them, terrifying them always, that they were being watched by the Russians who, if they had an opportunity, would slip nerve agents into their food. And, and so he, he just abused these people in the most horrific way for 10 years. The police said he was evil and in a class of his own. Now, however bad Hendy Freegard was, if Jesus is a con man, if he's lying about being God, he has deceived millions into giving not just cash, but everything for him. If he's lying, he deserves the cross and everything that came before it, because he has conned children, single mums, little old ladies by the millions into relying on him for what he can't provide. Does that sound like Jesus? What did he say? How did he live? Is he a con man? We're back to that vital question that's been answered partly in, in, in last week's text. Mm -hmm. Who is Jesus? Let me draw some clear distinctions. I want to say first, a con man makes promises he doesn't keep. And yet the Lord Jesus always kept his promises. He promised his disciples even that Lazarus' condition wouldn't end in death. And then Lazarus died. But it wasn't the end of the story. Because Jesus went to the tomb and Lazarus is raised. Even death can't stop Jesus, who is God, from keeping his promises. Second, a con man acts humbly, but he's always self-centered. You know that Boston is a very Catholic Irish Catholic part of the US. And there was a priest who every day would walk down the same road and he had passed two beggars as he did. They both had the same words on their signs, need money for food. And on the first beggar sign that he passed was the Star of David. And he looked in his hat and there was no money in it whatsoever. And then as he carried on, he'd come to the, the next sign and next to the words, need money for food, was a, a crucifix. And this man's hat was overflowing with money. And he'd watch how uh, people from his congregation would, would walk past, they would see the, the beggar with the star of David, and they'd turn their nose up, walk away, see the one with the crucifix, and purposely go out of their way to go and put money in his hat. Well, the, the priest started to feel sorry for this guy, and so one day he walked over to him and he said, you know, you're never going to make money here. E even if you just took the, the star of David off your sign, you'd stand a chance of making some money, but you're better off finding somewhere else. And the beggar called down the street to the other beggar and he said, Hey Ishmael, look who's telling the Goldstein brothers how to do business. You know, the only people who made themselves look weak and small in order to get an advantage over somebody. I can't remember if it's Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahm, the serial killer. You to walk with a cane and a limp in order to make their victims lower their guard and get an advantage over them. It's the classic work of the con man, appear humble, but always act with your interests at heart. The Lord Jesus, though he is humble, never shows a shred of self-centeredness. 
even when he's exhausted or hungry. He doesn't turn anyone away. He's the most important man who walked on our world. And yet he welcomed children and lepers and tax collectors and other social outcasts. This council has power to execute him, and yet he doesn't try charming his way out like some grease ball. But he silently, humbly takes the cup of rum poured out for him. Thirdly, a con man claims to love others, but only loves self. And yet, if there was ever a man who loved his friends, it was Jesus. He saw patient and warm towards doddering disciples, so gentle with them. Having loved them, he loved them to the end. On the hours before his torture and death, he keeps teaching them, trying to prepare them for what's to come, urging them, watch and pray. And then in the greatest act of selfless love the world has ever seen, he's nailed to a cross to save his people. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. Arthur Conan Doyle famously said, you know, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. The Lord Jesus claimed to be God. No doubt about it. The Lord Jesus wasn't a con man. No doubt about that. What are we left with? But though it seems so improbable, Jesus is God. Now what does that mean? Well, it has implications for everyone, everywhere, but keeping with our text, what does it mean here? Let me say three things. One, he was wrongfully accused. If Jesus is God, it is not blasphemy in any way to call himself God. It's just the truth. And so Jesus is innocent of this charge. Secondly, he's wrongfully condemned. If these men believed that Jesus was God, they were never going to say, Death! They'd have fallen on their faces and worshipped. They'd have confessed with Thomas, My Lord and my God. But though Jesus wears the blindfold, it's the council that can't see. Thirdly, he knew exactly who was hitting him. Those words that they're saying, whether it's counselors or soldiers, prophesy who was it who landed that blow on your jaw. He knew exactly who it was. He knew them. He knew them in their mother's womb. And he knew their family and their friends and their hopes and their dreams. He's their God. Allowing them to treat him like dirt. And he knows you. And he knows that the arguments that you, you bring against him often like punches. He knows the disinterest that you show in him. He knows you use his name as a swear word and, and mock his people and secretly love about them behind their back. And yet still he knows you. And he loves you. It raises the question, doesn't it? Surely men couldn't be sold alive. Come on, just 20 minutes. If that, we just thought this through. Taken this claim. Put it up against a, a con man. Ask that question. Who is Jesus? And we can see there's more to this guy than first meets the eye. And so we say, surely then, these men, these judges in Israel would have known better. Surely they wouldn't have been so blind. If Jesus was God, somebody would have seen. Aristotle taught that two things dropped at the same time. Whichever one was heaviest would land first. And for 2,000 years that was accepted truth. And then in 1589, Galileo began experiments dropping things off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He dropped a 10 pound weight and a 1 pound weight, and he assembled a group of physics professors at the bottom of the tower to watch. And they watched as these weights fell and hit the floor at exactly the same time. And yet, even though they'd seen it with their own eyes, they refused to accept that they landed at the same time. They said one landed a, a fraction of a second earlier and continued to say Aristotle was right. Now the high priest and this council are like those professors. They've got all the evidence in front of them, but they could not accept Jesus is God. It's unthinkable. There's no way Jesus could be God. In fact, Caiaphas is already convinced that it's better for one man to die for Israel than for Rome to find out Jesus is seen as some sort of king and then come in and crush the nation. And so he and his cronies are personally determined to see Jesus die. 
So much so, in fact, that he puts on this display of tearing his robes. We might think that this is genuine from Caiaphas, but I don't think so, because he would know from the book of Deuteronomy, it is totally illegal for the high priest to tear his robe. They were not permitted to do that. The high priest is to be calm, he's to act on God's behalf. Tearing his robe is not something for the high priest to do, not to be ruled by passion, but he is determined to see Jesus killed, and this display is going to deeply affect the rest of the council, and he knows it. They're going to look, they're going to gasp, and they're going to say, the high priest has torn his robe. There's only one outcome of this trial now. Now, I'm not excusing these men, but at least you and I can see why they made this awful decision. They're influenced by their culture, by their upbringing, their education, by pressure of position, and then steamrolled by charismatic Caiaphas. Those things are blinded. On these cold nights you get into your car and the windshield steamed up. It's foggy, out especially by the river and raining. If you try and drive, you'll make a big mistake. Do not think for one moment that you are free from similar influences that cloud your judgment of who Jesus is. I'm saying don't doubt for a moment how blind you can be spiritually to who Jesus is. We are people of our time. And we live in a world that doesn't want Jesus. And we are influenced by a media who call Christians bigoted and love and opportunity to make them seem small and outdated and behind the times. We live among friends who say it's uncool to be religious. We have hearts that want to rule themselves and are desperate to find any excuse to throw away a God who claims to have a right to make the decisions over how we should live. And we have sins that we desperately do not want to let go of, even though they're dragging us with them to hell. Do not doubt how spiritually blind we all naturally are. You take the opportunity this morning to cry out to Jesus, help me see. You think of bellowing Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's all. Jesus comes to this blind man. What do you want? I want to see. Jesus opens his heart. Can you do that with the eyes of your heart? You call out to him. He's the only hope you have of seeing who he really is. Let's stand and sing together.